You have to treat it like a business and it will not, it will not, not, not stifle your creativity. In fact, the opposite. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. When you decide to turn your art into a business, you open yourself up to so much opportunity, as well as a whole host of challenges. Critique and criticism become a part of your daily routine because it's that critique that makes customers happy with an end product. And I can remember from my photography days that a lot less of your time is dedicated to actually creating and way more is spent on the nuts and the bolts of running a business. Someone whose artistic talent as well as her business sense I admire so much is Sheila Chen. Her pet portraits and children's literature art are so special. My parents actually have an original Sheila Chen art piece hanging in their home of their late pup, Kobe. I am so excited to hear all about Sheila's journey into the creative entrepreneur space, what she's learned about navigating the space, how she markets her craft, and the lessons and boundaries that keep her business a fulfilling endeavor. Artists, makers, musicians, designers, photographers, anyone who turns their art into a business, this one's for you. Here she is, Sheila Chen. Thanks to Organifi for supporting Gold Digger. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends for plant-based nutrition that tastes great. To get 15% off any product, go to Organifi.com slash Gold Digger and use the promo code Gold Digger. This episode is made possible by Purple. The Purple Grid sets the Purple mattress apart from every other mattress. It's a patented comfort technology that instantly adapts to your body's natural shape and sleep style. For a limited time, get 10% off any order of $200 or more when you use the code GOLDDIGGER10. Go to purple.com slash GOLDDIGGER10. Terms apply. Oh my goodness. After this guest sent me a DM, it inspired me so much. I literally screenshotted it and sent it to my team. And I said, we have got to get Sheila on the podcast. So welcome to the Gold Digger podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited. So let's kick this off for anyone who's not familiar with who you are and what you do. Tell me the story of Sheila Chen and the pinnacle moments of your life and career that led you to where you are today. Happily. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) My name is Sheila Chen. I am a pet portrait artist and a children's book illustrator. And I currently live in Hawaii with my husband and our almost two-year-old boy and our two dogs, Sarah and Hef. And ironically, like Jenna doesn't know this. I'm just saying this right now. (laughs) Surprise. (laughs) My major aha moment to pursue pet portraits was listening to this podcast three years ago. And I was reminded by that from your 400th episode. And congrats, Jenna, for 400th episode. That's such a huge feat. So 400 episodes, everyone's so passionate still. And you did a clip playback on your first episode. And I remember that moment so clearly. I remember what I was wearing. I remember how cold I was in Connecticut. (laughs) I remember you saying... If you need permission, I'm giving it to you. And that really pierced my heart. I was in the moment of deciding what I wanted to dive into. And that was that was a huge pinnacle moment for me. Mm -hmm. And so before I really digress into that, (laughs) my origin story, I've been an artist forever. I tell people I came out of the womb with a brush in my hand. (laughs) I pursued art in college. I taught kids after college and I knew it was always going to be part of my life. I wanted to be an animator. And in fact, I was working on a portfolio to get into animation, but then I fell in love and I joined a military spouse life. (laughs) And we immediately got stationed across the country away from all the opportunities that I had 
And it was during this transition that I discovered boundaries and I kind of discovered what it is that I really wanted to do. The military transition was really intense. I'm a Cali girl. I don't know what snow is. (laughs) I know Minnesota snows a lot, but Connecticut's pretty cold too. (laughs) And so I moved to this place where winter was coming and there were a lot of like obstacles to overcome. It was a community that wasn't very diverse. I'm very Asian. (laughs) I remember ordering my first plate of rice and they put soy sauce on it. And I was like, wait, what is this? Like, no, (laughs) order rice. It should just be rice. Why do they put soy sauce on it? (laughs) It was just like a huge transition for me. And I realized that the cold reality of being in the military and to be the wife I want to be, to be the mom, potential mom I want to be, animation just was not an option for me. We were sharing a car. We were on a low budget. I was ready to go and take classes, but there were no classes nearby. There were no animation studios nearby. So I actually had a moment of realizing my dreams were shattered. And on top of that, I wasn't making any money. And for someone who's been working since she was 18, financial independence was really important to me. So I started spiraling and I turned to my husband and I asked him like, hey, what do you think of me just giving it a year? Just a year. Hear me out. $500 is what I'm asking for. (laughs) (laughs) I budgeted it. I've been listening to podcasts. Like, you know, I need a website. I need to like register myself as a domain and as a business and all of that stuff. And he, he looked at me and he was like, yeah, of course, like go for it. And (laughs) I was like, wait, 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 no, like, let's set some more limitations. Like, okay. <laughs> I thought this would be harder. <laughs> why, like, why are you so okay with this? <laughs> I actually talked to him about it yesterday. And he, he was like, I remember laughing at you when you were, you came to me with this plan. Like I've written down a plan of how I'm going to invest this money that I'm going to take from our joint account. <laughs> and he, he was just so supportive. And so I just dove in and I, I've been very fortunate that my first year I, was in a Jurd gallery show in Mystic. I did logo designs for local businesses. I started pursuing children's books. I really tried everything that that interested me and it was doing really well. I even tried pet portraits during this time, but literally everything I've tried did not feel good. And I was thriving on paper, but I was so unhappy. And then I realized like there must be something underlying that I, I just can't name. There's something holding me back. So at 27 years old, I went to go see therapy. And within the first session, my therapist turned to me afterwards and told me, you have CPTSD. And I was like, what? 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 What is that? Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, well, you know, PTSD, it's, you, we all know it. It's on the media, right? Like someone gets triggered and then they get pulled back into this traumatic event and their body reacts like they're in that moment. But yep. CPTSD is complex PTSD where you might have experienced long-term trauma. And so it's complex because you don't always, you can't pinpoint just one moment. So it's harder to know what's going to trigger you in the future. And it's debilitating because it could range from like something triggers me and I'm suddenly just like, I'm upset and unreasonably so. Like I know that I'm being unreasonably upset, but I don't know why to like, I can't breathe. I'm having a panic attack. I'm crying hysterically in my bed. I can't get up. And I just don't know what, why. And after she told me I have CPTSD, after some research, I had like two major feelings. One was shame that I have something I have to, I'm not healthy. Right. And the other one was freedom of like, wow, what a relief. I could put a name on what's been holding me back. So we dove right into it and I learned that the kryptonite to triggers is boundaries. It's why I'm so adamant about boundaries in my life. And when I talk to people about starting businesses or for people who have been struggling with triggers like I have, everyone talks about it. You just talked about it in your, your episode with your husband yeah. and it's so necessary. You hear it all the time. Everyone who's been successful talks about boundaries. Like when people say work-life balance, that is boundaries. But nobody has ever said like, hey, this is how you set a healthy boundary for those of us who have never been taught it because it is a taught thing. It is a taught behavior. 
And I was unaware of it until I was 27 years old. And I felt a little bit old for that. But But so what my therapist had taught me and something I want to share, and if there's anything I hope that someone can take from this, it's, it's just this formula of what a boundary is. And it's simply, hey, friend, last time we talked, ABC happened. It made me feel one, two, three. Could we instead do re me? Ooh, I like that. Can you say that one more time? Hey, friend, last time we talked, ABC happened. It made me feel one, two, three. Could we instead do re me? Mm-hmm. Obviously influenced by the Jackson Five, but <laughs> <laughs> oh. it works for me. And that's like the bare minimum. That's like, that is what a boundary is set. You can change it. You can dress it however you want with whatever situation you're in. But it's saying what it is. It's expressing how you feel and how you're affected and offering a solution, which is what a lot of us tend to not think about for the next step. And so I just started practicing boundaries everywhere. Like with all of my friends, I started with my friends. I have the most amazing, most incredible friends growing up. They've supported me since I was like seven years old (laughs) saying that I want to be an artist. They were like, yeah, go for it. So (laughs) they embraced all of that. And I was growing my confidence as an artist. I was growing my confidence as an adult, a mentally healthier adult. And then I was leaning towards pet portraits. And that's when I listened to your podcast and Jenna Kutcher pierced my heart. (laughs) Mm. Tell me more. This is so good, Sheila. And thank you just too for vulnerably sharing that piece of your story, because I think that A lot of creative people, especially artists, struggle with that mental health. And especially, too, when you pursue something that you are so wildly passionate about, boundaries are incredibly hard to build because there's that thrill of like, I can't believe somebody's paying me to do what I love. But very quickly, that can transfer into this idea of like, picking up your paintbrush is suddenly work. And suddenly that passion can, you know, shift a little bit. So, Let's start with this because I think you are the perfect person to answer this question. But what do you think people often get wrong or don't understand about starting a business in the creative field? Because you're not that far removed from that starting line. And I think that your advice is going to be so, so powerful. I think what you said is exactly on point where artists they are almost scared of losing their original voice, right? Like yeah. They want to hold on to that and they feel like success means that you sold yourself out. Yes. And I think as an artist and as a creative in general, you have to embrace the business part of it. You can't be a professional artist without the profession. And you can be a hobby artist and that's fine. There's no judgment there. You can still make, you know, a side hustle doing that. But if you want to be a full-time artist, you have to embrace all the hats that come with it. You have to treat it like a business and it will not, it will not, not, not stifle your creativity. In fact, the opposite with business boundaries, it actually helps you find your niche. It helps you clean up your voice and your vision And it forces you to focus. And I think creativity is the last problem an artist has. How many things you want to do is the last problem you have. (laughs) Where to start and how to focus and know what feels right is the hardest. And the only way you're going to do that is by honing in and finding a lane. And if that lane doesn't work for you, then just move lanes. It's fine. You can move lanes as much as you want. Yeah. I noticed, especially as a photographer, that so many photographers were so wildly passionate about being behind the camera and and taking those beautiful images. But when you run a business around that passion, 90 to 95% of your time is usually managing the business. And Mm -hmm. that, you know, small sliver of time is reserved for that actual passion. And I think that a lot of times in creative entrepreneurship, we put so much focus on mastery of the art 
that we never learn how to build like sustainable business practices or profitable business systems that allow us to keep that passion alive. You recently shared with me the DM that I referenced and the incredible success you've seen with your pet portrait business. Tell me a little bit about that. And then I want to know kind of what you've identified as your secret sauce. Oh, I love the secret sauce. I did the secret sauce challenge like or yes. quiz when I found Jenna Kutcher. In my head, I met you, Jenna, three years ago. <laughs> we, we've been longtime friends, my girl. <laughs> pet portraits. When I decided pet portraits, it was not an easy decision because I think in the art world, it's kind of a sellout. Like I went to school. I went to art school for this. I, You're taught you're supposed to be like a conceptual artist. And that's yeah. what the classes are geared towards. And pet portraits is just painting dogs and cats, right? Like it's, <laughs> it seems like a cop out. And I think my pride held me back a lot. And I thought, yeah. you know, like pet portraits can't be conceptual, but I feel like I've made it conceptual for myself. And it was actually at that moment that I had listened to your podcast and I was like, no, I'm going to do this. Your permission to just pursue the creative field. It was for me, what I took from that was permission to take away all my preconceived notions of what it's supposed to look like and just jump into the unknown. Yeah. And ever since then, my business boomed. My first holiday season for creatives, for makers, holiday season is our moneymaker. And I started my business in September of 2017. And I remember thinking, I have to be a bridesmaid (laughs) for two of my best friends in 2018. Bridesmaids, it's expensive. All the ladies, you know? We we know. We know. (laughs) (laughs) It's really expensive. And I wasn't making money. So I was like, you know what? If I'm going to do this, Let's see if this is going to work. First holiday season, I just want to make between two to $3,000. Let's lowball a little bit. That's what I want to do so that I can cover at least my bridesmaid expenses. And I hit that number my first week. And I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> this could be lucrative. So then I started pushing. And my first year, I made more my first year than I did as an after school manager as an art teacher. I was like, okay, well, that's great. (laughs) Yeah. And then my second year, I started finding my, my thing. I spent that second year looking for in the pet portrait world. How do I, how do I put me out there? How do I make it my brand? So I spent time doing that. I also got a chance to illustrate a children's book for Jared and Ashley from the bachelor in paradise, Yes, (laughs) which was wild. (laughs) And then now I am pushing, my business is projected to make six figures, which is wild to me. And whether or not I hit it this year, because who knows what COVID is going to bring. I know, I know guaranteed I can hit it next year. So that's wild that I can tell my son as he grows up that mommy makes more money than daddy painting dogs and cats. (laughs) (laughs) In my list of non-negotiables to feel my best, sleep is pretty near the top. If your mattress has been following you around since college or your pillow is flat like a pancake or you've never really given much thought to what you're sleeping on, then this is a purple PSA for you. The purple pillow and mattress are unlike anything you've ever slept on. The purple grid sets the purple mattress apart from every other mattress. It's this patented comfort technology that instantly adapts to your body's natural shape and sleep style. With over 18 1,500 open air channels designed to neutralize body heat, Purple provides a cooling effect that other mattresses can't replicate. And this cutting edge technology doesn't just stop with the mattresses. Every Purple pillow is engineered with a grid for total head and neck support and absolute airflow. So you're always on the cool side of the pillow. You can try every Purple product risk-free with free shipping and returns, and Purple has financing available as low as 0% APR for qualified customers. So I've been playing with this purple squishy that they sent for me to get a feel of that grid technology. And truly, it's cool to the touch and it looks futuristic. 
If your mattress is stuck in the past, experience the Purple Grid and sleep like you've never slept before. Go to purple.com slash golddigger10 and use the promo code golddigger10. For a limited time, you'll get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash golddigger10, promo code golddigger10 for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Terms apply. Tell me if you can relate to this. You love the idea of fresh pressed juice and you know it's good for you, but the process of shopping for the produce, washing and preparing it, and then trashing your kitchen for one single glass of okay tasting vegetable juice is just simply too much work. So you skip the juice altogether. I think Organifi might be mind readers and knew that I needed something easier. Organifi reached out and told me about their line of organic superfood blends that offer great tasting plant-based nutrition in a powder that I just mix with water. Organifi uses the highest quality plant-based ingredients that taste delicious with just water and contains less than three grams of sugar per serving. Each Organifi product offers a different set of health benefits, like helping increase energy with the red juice I love or calming support so you can fall asleep with ease with gold tea. It costs less than $3 per day and no extra shopping required or mess to clean up. After a heated debate, Drew and I determined that the red juice is our favorite. Or uh, maybe the gold is tough to choose. To get 15% off any product, go to Organifi.com slash Gold Digger and use the promo code Gold Digger. That's 15% off any product at O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com slash Gold Digger with the promo code Gold Digger. I love that you share, though, too, even some of those like preconceived notions within the areas that we feel passionate and how sometimes even we think like the external judgment or the judgment of peers in the industry matters more than the joy we bring to the consumers, the people that we're creating for. And I think that happens a lot when it comes to like artistic visions and creative endeavors, because we've been kind of conditioned to believe that certain ways of expressing our creativity are more valuable than others. But I think that you are proof that one, the riches are in the niches when you get really specific and you serve people in that meaningful way that you can find success but also too, that there has to be these people that take on these different creative endeavors to serve people that need what they've got. And if you didn't step into that side of your gift, there would be people like me who wouldn't get to receive that gift and know how much it makes a difference. Yes. I love that. Riches are in the niches. I love that so much. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So I want to know, we've kind of touched on it when it comes to boundaries, but what have you learned about setting boundaries that's helped you grow and scale your business? Because, you know, when you started with just that small goal of just making a few thousand dollars to help fund your bridesmaid adventures to now growing a six figure business, what kind of boundaries have you had to set to make that possible? I think being a mom had a huge part of that. When I started Pet Portraits, I was fully aware that I wanted to become a mom. Part of me going to therapy was to make sure that I was the healthiest version of myself or I can start that journey. And when I became a mom, I'm sure you felt the same. Like suddenly nothing else really matters. We've been working our whole lives to be career women or to be passionate about work. And now it's like you have to protect that precious time to watch your child grow, but you still want to work. So it's finding that boundary of when can I focus on family? When can I focus on work? And then after that, diving full in one way or the other. And on top of that, my husband and I, have been talking about boundaries almost on the daily now because we have to talk about what, you know, military life, what's the schedule tomorrow? Because we don't always know. And yeah. that affects what I can do. Do I pick him up? Am I in charge? Am I the caregiver today or tomorrow? And that makes me focus on my time. And in my time, I made me realize I need to create work that can be made faster, that can still be offered quality and be efficient. And that's actually when I discovered my own style of doing pet portraits. It's called impostos with a W because there's a pun. (laughs) It's being trademarked. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's like, we're so close to getting it done being trademarked. And I discovered it because of the business boundaries I built. And a lot of that is also watching other artists who have been successful. Two artists in mine are Kim Sealbeck and Sarah Cottle. They're on the island. They're phenomenal artists who have let me watch them do their thing before I found my own style or my own thing. And I envied them. I envied them so much because they had they had their thing. They had a thing where I'm like, okay, I can spot a Kim Sealbeck a mile away. I know that's a Carol <laughs> Cottle original. You know, that that's yes. the artist level I want to get at. Yes. But for pet portraits. So seeing them set boundaries for their practice and their business of like saying no, the power of saying no to projects that don't bring you joy to make space for the projects that do. Yeah. And then setting boundaries of like, Hey, my, my time is worth it. If, if you're not paying me enough to step away from my son, then it's not worth my time. There has to be a value to my hour And that made me reevaluate how I value myself. Yeah. I think that's a huge, huge, huge gap for entrepreneurs and specifically early entrepreneurs. I think that so many of us have only been taught to value our time in the way that the world has told us what it's worth. You know, whether you've made $10 an hour or $20 an hour, you start to just kind of compute those numbers in your head. And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, they never really sit down and do the math to figure out what that working hourly rate is. I remember when I was a photographer, the first time I got paid $200, I I felt like a millionaire. And I was like, (laughs) oh my God, I just, I shot photos for an hour and I made $200. And then when I actually started to do the math about the amount of time it took me to drive there and prep and edit and deliver and, you know, all of those things, I did the math and I was making like $7 an hour. And And so I think that, that, yes, (laughs) yes, exactly. And so I love that you bring this up because I think it's such a powerful reminder specifically for entrepreneurs, but also too, for people that are juggling many roles in today's now, you know, we're trying to be parents and teachers and spouses and partners and family members and all of these things to really understand the value of an hour can totally transform the way that you look at time. I love that you brought that up, Sheila. I want to know, how did you generate leads or attract clients at the beginning of your business? I'm sure you had some really great ways. So tell me about that. So I call it the creeper method. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me more. (laughs) It's strategy, guys. I'm, I'm a strategic person. Even back then, I would go to, I would go to a coffee shop, specifically Starbucks. Because as a military wife, I like consistency and Starbucks was always open at a certain time and always offered Wi-Fi. And if you have the gold card, you can get refills all day. So (laughs) I would go to Starbucks and I would position myself so that my back was facing the condiment bar. And I would paint and have my business cards on the edge of the table. And so people would come over fill up their cup with cream or sugar or whatever, grab a napkin, throw away their straw trash, and they would stand there and look over my shoulder and watch me work. And it's very specific because if you face them, if you are facing them, they're not going to look. They don't want to have that pressure of or feel like they're invading your bubble. But when your back is turned against them, people want to creep. (laughs) Yes. People are curious and I'm giving them permission because my back is turned against them. They feel like they're like, they feel like they're doing it secretly, but I can sense it for for like a mile away. I can, I can definitely feel it, (laughs) but it worked. It worked so well. I became the Starbucks girl who knew that there was a Starbucks artist who was painting pets and people would come over and say, Hey, my friend told me you were doing this and they'll pick up business cards. I'm an introvert extrovert. So I enjoy being in public and painting, but I don't necessarily like being talked to. So I'll have earphones on and I'll have my business cards out and it worked so well. People just grab and go and shoot me an email later on saying, Hey, I saw you at Starbucks today or whatever it is. 
And so I built that on referrals. And gosh, people don't value that enough, I think, in this day and age with social media and everything. The the old way of doing things still work. The door to door, word of mouth, referral, that is like gold right there. Yeah. Yeah. And those are loyal clientele who want to hire you year and year again. And I I remember that. So actually this year, that was back then. And now this year, I actually started a referral program for my loyal pack members. That's what I call them. And I give it back to them because truly like your businesses aren't what it is without the fans and the people supporting it. I think that's so, so I created this smart. Little program and from my past for learning those lessons and it's fun. It's a really fun pack. We do games. I you know, they learn social media strategy through being part of my pack and they can win like points store credit just by achieving certain game goals. <laughs> So cool. You're so yeah. smart. Oh my goodness. I want to know something that I'm so curious about is have you ever been challenged in the fact that you have created a business around custom work? Has there ever been this like tempting desire to create more passive pieces when you customize in like drawing people's pets so that they're so real? It's like you could touch them. What does that feel like? I love how custom it is because of the art world. The art world, I don't know a single artist who hasn't had their artwork stolen. Yeah. Or yeah, everyone stylized. Like I'm dealing with that right now, actually. And going back to boundaries, let's let's talk about flexing your your muscles, your copyright muscles. <laughs> yeah. There was a big art company that actually took my original artwork of someone else's dog, which is so strange, took that artwork and used it as an ad, as a paid ad without my permission. And it's a big company. So it's like a huge national thing. People, thousands of people can see this. So I actually flexed my muscles and hired a lawyer (laughs) and won a settlement that I can't really talk about too much because of contracts, but... (laughs) it's like doing the custom work actually makes me feel more safe Yeah, from a world yeah. that like loves to just take artists for granted almost. Yeah, But I do do a lot of passive stuff too. Like I not really passive. It's like a combo where I do digital specials and I design yearly fun, like holiday stuff right now. It's the Christmas time. So lots of like reindeers or snow stuff or gingerbread and it's a custom design, but you can have your pet in it. And so it's like a plug and chug kind of situation. It's like with Lightroom for you photographers, like taking your personal settings and copy and pasting it everywhere. (laughs) Mm, I love that. Is there anything in your business journey that you wish you would have done sooner or done differently? Oh my goodness. Yes. So much, right? (laughs) I don't like saying hindsight's 2020 anymore because 2020 has been a dumpster on fire, but (laughs) hindsight 2021, maybe... (laughs) (laughs) If I could go back, I would have told myself in the very beginning of my journey to trust your guts, trust yourself. There's scientific proof or just it's it's proven in science that like when you are triggered or when you feel like something's off and you don't know what it is, your brain firing for you before you consciously understand what's happening and you need to trust your gut. Cause that's, that's based on experience on personal experience that your body is telling you, Hey, don't do that. Or, Hey, this is great. Do it. The green light and the red light, listen to yourself. And that, that's such a hard lesson to learn to like have that confidence. Yeah. And to trust what you know is best, even if nobody else is there to to support it, even if it, it might like you don't understand it fully, you have to trust yourself. That would save you so much heartache. <laughs> yeah. And one more thing I would probably tell myself back then would be like to keep professional and personal separate. Hmm. Tell me I more. I think as creative entrepreneurs, one of three of us are depressed. That's just the statistics. One of three of us is dealing with depression. And so it's natural for this creative community to almost be desire that like friendship, that camaraderie it exists and you should find it, find your pack, but 
when it comes to your job and your day-to-day, keep your personal and professional life separate. I love that. And I think that goes back to boundaries, right? Yes. Yes. Look at you. Look (laughs) at you. (laughs) I want to know what is your advice for someone wanting to start and grow their own creative business? Do the work. Yeah. Do it. Do the work. Listen to people like Jenna Kutcher, who has done the work and listen to all of the wonderful free sources of successful people giving you free information. They all say the same things, yeah. right? Like do yeah. the work, be mindful, be healthy, take care of yourself. If you're physically and mentally not healthy, how can you thrive? Define your own success. Don't look at, I mean, it's, we're always compared. The comparison game is always going to be there. I like to embrace it instead of being like, oh, I'm doing it again. Like I like yeah. to embrace the comparison game and be like, okay, this is just motivation for me to do the work, get off my phone and do better. I would also encourage people who want to create, do the creative career, that the grass is in fact greener on this side. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Sing it. (laughs) Life is richer. The soil is packed with delicious nutrients. You will thrive. You just have to Push yourself to do the work. Take the first step of your journey. And you have to also know, like, you know, we're talking about like things, misconceptions. I think a misconception of the creative life, which 2020, I think has changed people's perceptions because now everyone has to work at home. Yeah. And now everyone knows, hey, this isn't just peaches and cream. This is not like the best thing in the world. This is hard. It's hard work to find time to focus and to get into that space to work while your child's in the room next door or you got laundry to do or you can see the kitchen and it looks like a mess. It's hard to work at home. It's more work to have your own business and you have to embrace it. Yeah, absolutely. Sheila, I have to tell you that the portrait you made for my parents' dog is prominently displayed on their wall and it really, really touched them. We had our dog for a very long time. He was, I think, 14 years old, just a piece of their lives. And so I just want to say and remind you that the work you are doing and the path you are on absolutely changes people's lives and helps them commemorate their family members in the form of pets in such a beautiful and special way. And so I just honor your work to the fullest extent. And I am so grateful that you listened to the bit that said that you have permission and followed those dreams. So I just want to say thank you for that. I appreciate that so much. Where can everybody find you and connect with you and check out your work and get their own puppy or kitty portrait? Tell me all the places. I'm very active on Instagram. My handle is Sheila Chen Art. My website is also everything is Sheila Chen Art. (laughs) I'm also just started doing YouTube live where we call it dirty chai sketch time where you come over. I drink my dirty chai and I give away free sketches and it's like, it's created a, quite a community of pet lovers and we just talk about our dogs and cats and it's a great positive space for everyone. Amazing. Sheila, thank you so much for coming on the show today and also for being a listener of this podcast. It is literally an honor to be able to feature you and your story and your work. It is an honor to be here and it's, Again, such a wild ride to be three years ago, right there listening to Jenna thinking maybe someday and here someday. So (laughs) yes, welcome to someday. Yes, I made it. (laughs) We have arrived. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I love it. It is such a gift to be able to interview listeners of this very show. 
Sheila has made an impact in my life personally by creating my parents' portrait of their sweet dog, Kobe, who is a part of our world for so long. And I am just so grateful for this conversation that reminds us that we can, in fact, pursue our passions and turn them into profits. But with that endeavor, there comes a lot of need for boundaries and for creativity and to leave room to pivot and change and grow. I'm so grateful to have heard and been a part of Sheila's story. I hope that you leave this episode feeling inspired and on fire. Until next time, gold diggers, keep on digging your biggest goal. And remember, the riches can be in the niches. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 